Thank you, Dr. Reed. Um, so I, I just wanted to say before we go on, I'm going to introduce a lot of the speakers, and I think many of you have these programs, and so you can read about their bios, but we do have online viewers who don't necessarily have those bios in front of them. And so even though a lot of you can read exactly what I'm going to say, I feel like it's important to give the uh, credentials of the speakers that we have because the subjects, subjects that they're talking on are um, pretty specific to their particular ex areas of expertise. And uh, certainly this next speaker is no exception with um, Dr. Roberta Dwyer, who's going to talk to us. Uh, pretty much a discussion and overview of disaster preparedness for horse facilities and really nobody better suited to speak on the subject. Dr. Roberta Dwyer is a professor in the Department of Animal and Food Sciences at the University of Kentucky, where she is an extension veterinarian and teacher pre-veterinary advisor. She has consulted and made numerous national and international presentations about equine infectious diseases and biosecurity for more than 25 years. She is co-author of a national program for agricultural emergency operations planning and online and an online course in animal agro-security. She was co-editor of the international publication Lloyd's Equine Disease Quarterly for over 20 years. She has been named Iowa State University Distinguished Young Alumnus, Kentucky Veterinary Medical Association's Veterinarian of the Year, and was awarded the Joe T. Davis Outstanding Advisor Award for, activities, for her activities as the pre-veterinary advisor at Kentucky. So, to speak on uh, disaster preparedness for horse facilities, please welcome Dr. Roberta Dwyer. Good morning, I'm very pleased to be here and uh, welcome to Kentucky and welcome to everybody who's out there in the audience. One of the mantras of people who are in disaster preparedness is failing to plan is planning to fail. Everyone here is gonna be given some homework to go home and do, and hopefully you'll be reporting back to um, either your family, your facilities, your farm, and you will have a plan by the time you have your, your homework done. One of the big problems that we have in biosecurity and disaster preparedness is people think it won't happen to me. It won't happen to my farm, it won't happen to my house, it won't happen to my racetrack facility. But we all know from this past year that many bad things have happened. This past year, 2017, there was multiple billion dollar disasters in the United States. $16 billion worth of disaster relief went to these from, and you've, you've seen it on the, on the news, from the wildfires to hurricanes to blizzards, tornadoes, hailstorms. And some of you that are here, some of you that are are viewing by the streaming webinar, you've been in these disasters, so you know firsthand. But some of you might not have. A disaster can be your house on fire. It doesn't have to be Hurricane Maria. It could be your barn that's on fire. It can be your horse trailer that is overturned on the interstate. So having a plan for those disasters that might befall you, whether you're in Alaska, you're in Florida, you're in Arizona or Maine, that's what's gonna help you recover and get back into business faster. This is West Liberty, Kentucky on March 2nd, 2013. <clears throat> this is an F3 tornado. If you see that in the sky, you should be in the basement, in the bathtub, underneath the stairs. You should be taking a shelter immediately. Tornadoes don't discriminate against who they wipe off the face of the earth. I grew up in Iowa. I hit the basement many, many, many times. I've seen these things for real and up close. Um, oftentimes you'll see this and people are outside taking pictures and what they don't do is they don't look overhead. If the atmosphere is this unstable, there might be a tornado overhead. It's not just over there. Oh, look at that great tornado. I'm gonna take a picture and send it in to social media. Look overhead because there might be something that's coming down to pick you up. You should be hitting the basement. You should be hitting the bathtub. Lightning. If you can hear thunder, if you can see lightning, and you're outside, you can be struck by lightning yourself. 
There's none of this, you know, oh, between thunder and lightning, if there's three seconds, that means it's three miles away. I've got three minutes before I actually have to do something. I'll stand out here and take pictures. No. If you can see that, if you can hear thunder, you can be struck by lightning and you can be struck dead. If you're on a horse, horses don't like lightning. A lot of them don't like thunder. You're on an unstable animal. And that lightning can travel through the ground and come up through those metal shoes and you can get bucked off in a heartbeat. And we have a panel that's gonna be talking about that. Take lightning and thunder extremely seriously. There was a tornado warning yesterday afternoon in Jefferson County, Kentucky, which is Louisville. Tornado warning, the sirens went off. People should have been hitting the basement. We had, we had a severe thunderstorm warning while we were here at a meeting at Keeneland. Potential 60 mile an hour winds. Straight line winds cause a lot of damage and it's a bad place to be if you're hauling a horse in a horse trailer and you're coming across state, straight line winds. I don't have to talk to the people in the western part of the United States about wildfires. We've seen this on the news. We've had wildfires here in Kentucky. Wherever you have drought, very dry tinder, you can have wildfires. It's not just in the western states. Flooding from hurricanes, from six feet of water hitting Houston, from four inches hitting Maryland that it's all going downhill down Main Street, causes flooding, water kills, and flooding is the number one killer of people in disasters in the United States of America. This is what happens to horses standing in floodwaters. You can see where the flood line was of where this horse was standing in floodwaters in Louisiana. The skin is the largest organ in the body, whether it's a dog, a cat, a horse, or a human. That's, a significant, that's significant organ damage right there. We all think about hearts and kidneys and livers and, and intestines. The skin is the largest organ in the body, and it's the first line of defense for the immune system. That horse is extremely sick. What's in floodwaters? Pesticides, herbicides, diesel fuel, fecal coliforms, sewage, and I've heard people say to me, oh, it's diluted out because there's so much water. I don't think so. Hurricane aftermath, flooding, horses standing in water. And I'm not gonna belabor you with a lot of the tough kinds of things that horsemen, horsewomen and veterinarians see in some of these hurricanes but you, uh, and flooding issues, but there are some significant issues that people have to deal with. All disasters, Start and end locally. Whether it's your farm, your house, your county, and it might go up from there to Puerto Rico, to Hawaii, to multiple states in the West. The number one rule always has to be human health and safety come first. You need to plan for all disasters, not only natural disasters, which we're gonna to emphasize today, but also accidents and intentional kinds of disasters that happen. Disaster logistics, when you're looking at the entire population, not just horses, all disasters start and end locally. If the county or parish declares a disaster, then you have coordination through the county emergency operations center. If, it, if the needs expand beyond that community and they say, we need, we need help from the state, the governor will declare a governor's state of disaster, and that's when resources can get <clears throat> coordinated through the state emergency operations center, <clears throat> and states can ask for help from other neighboring states. If it gets bad enough where the, the president declares a disaster, then there are federal resources that can become available. Do those resources come into your farm where you've had your, your flooding within 24 hours? No. You have to be prepared to deal with those first three to five days, even seven days on your own. Help is not gonna be flying into a helicopter within two hours to help you out on your farm. You have to be self-sufficient. These are emergency support functions from the federal level. ESF 11, emergency support function number 11 is agriculture and natural resources. That's where the ag community comes in. That's where horses are generally classified under 
in the, the national response framework. Here's your homework. Do you have a personal disaster plan for if you have to evacuate, if you have a tornado, if you have a hurricane? What's the family disaster plan? Do you have a disaster plan for your farm or your facility, such as your racetrack? What's your communications plan? Do you have an evacuation plan? If you have advanced warning of there's a hurricane coming, you need to get out of town. There's 15 inches of rain coming. There's a mandatory evacuation. Do you have a plan to evacuate yourself, your family, your horses? Are your horses identified? Go home and get your horses microchipped. We could spend a whole day talking about how to identify horses before a natural disaster hits. Get them microchipped, keep it easy. Planning, plan for the expected situations and you will 95% be prepared for the really unusual or rare events. This was an ice storm that hit in 2006, right outside, and this is a picture right outside my home. There is an inch of ice on everything in a five county area here in central Kentucky. Loss of communications. We had no power for 13 days. It was icy, it was cold. No internet, no electricity. Horse farms, you, there was an inch of ice on everything. Trees were across roads. Your personnel were not gonna come in to be mucking stalls. No one was moving anywhere. Transportation was a challenge. Four-wheel drives are useless on ice. Communications. Some of you will see the, the princess phone in the middle. Our cell phones are great until a disaster happens and the cell towers are either down or they're overloaded with lots of phone calls in and out from people. Your cell phone might not work. Texting might not work. You might have to get a phone that actually is hardlined and you can plug into the wall if you still have landline service at your home. If you don't pay for landline service, call around to your neighbors, see who does. Because that might be the only form of communication that you've got. I have a, um, one of the examples here is a cordless telephone. Those are great, except you need electricity to have a dial tone. If you have no power and you have a cordless phone, you don't have communications. Communications are key to being, ask, being able to ask for help. Do you have a family disaster plan? That's part of my family right there. In the ice storm, 13 days, no power. Temperature in the house was 42 degrees, but we survived. Preparedness, what are the threats? We're talking about natural threats. An ice storm in Tucson, Arizona is probably not going to happen. That's going to be in that 5% of this is way outside the realm of norm. But what are your capabilities? Can your family, can your farm survive with no electricity for seven days? If you have well water, how does that water get up to the faucet? Electricity. No electricity and if you have well water, now you have no water. No water available to horses is a very bad situation. So you need to think about that. If you have well water, do you have a generator if you lose power? If you have a generator, do you know how to use it? Do you have fuel for that generator? No movement on or off the farm for seven days. That's what happened with that ice storm. It was ice and it wasn't melting real fast. No telephone or communications for seven days. Most of our teenagers would just die. They would shrivel up and die if they didn't have their internet and their cell phone for seven days. Just peel them off the walls and make them go do something because they're not going to be happy. If you have a 24 hour notice of evacuation, like there's, there's going to be flooding because we know there's, a, the National Weather Service has said we're gonna have a lot of rain coming in. Do you have an evacuation plan? If you have five horses but you have a two horse trailer, which two horses are you gonna get out of that farm? And where are you gonna go? If you have down fencing or loose animals, this is down fencing. This is no fencing after an F3 tornado. Go home and find out from your insurance company if your insurance plan covers for the replacement of fencing. Some of you will be surprised when the answer is no. Replacing fencing is an expensive cost for livestock owners and for horse owners after a flood, straight line winds, hurricanes, tornadoes. 
There's no fencing here. All those animals are loose. Get a NOAA weather radio, N-O-A-A -A weather radio. Keep ba fresh batteries, learn how to use it. When we were taught at um, weather training, when you have red next to green with a hook, you potentially have got a tornado and you've got a very bad event coming down the road. National Weather Service has free trainings. There are free trainings available online. Get a Doppler weather app for your phone. Someone I was sitting next to yesterday, I pulled up the weather map when I was looking out at the weather because I've taken weather training and know how to read the sky as a layperson. 60 mile an hour winds, there was a, there was a uh, severe thunderstorm warning out for Fayette County. Straight line winds can be a disaster when you're having, an, when you've, if you've got animals on the road. Straight line winds, tornadoes, huge amount of damage to communities. Debris pickup. Federal government is not gonna pay for debris pickup out of livestock pastures. This is a huge amount of work you've got Insulation, you've got shards of glass, you've got metal, you've got boards, you've got nails, and grass was growing by the inch every day. This is, this is a disaster. But we have to get that cleaned up so that we can get livestock and horses back out on those pastures. What about the no warning disaster? Many of you probably didn't think that this was an area for a hurricane, not for a hurricane, sorry, for an earthquake. This is the New Madrid Fault. The New Madrid Fault is a major earthquake fault in the middle of the United States of America. In 1811 and 1812, it went off at probably a 7.0 earthquake. It rang the bells in Boston. This was the affected area when it went off and it, it shook the earth in 1895. We don't think about us being an earthquake zone here in Fayette County in Lexington, Kentucky, but we are. A lot of people in California think that they, they have the exclusive rights on, on earthquakes with the San Andreas Fault, and now Oklahoma, you get shaken around quite a bit. On this part of the United States, we have some earthquake issues. Check and see if you can get some earthquake insurance. It's not that expensive if you don't live in New Madrid, Missouri. Some post-disaster issues. The inability to return to work, to your home or to your farm. That really frustrates people when they get sick. They get told no by the National Guard or the Sheriff's Department. No, you cannot return back to your home. But I've got my animals there, my horses are there. Search and rescue teams are in there trying to find people that are still in the disaster area. Electrical teams are still in that disaster area trying to turn off electricity so people don't get electrocuted. The energy companies are in there trying to make it safe so that when you are able to return to your farm, you're able to return to your home, that you don't get electrocuted, hopefully, that you don't get killed by a propane tank going off. They're trying to make things safe before they let you into an area. They're not trying to make your life hell. But that's what it seems like when you are desperate to get back in to find what's going on with your home, what's going on with your animals, what's happening with your facility. You have to work in the dark when you get back into your disaster zone. One of the best things you can have is a headlamp. And it can just be one of those camping lamps that you, you have on your head that frees up both of your hands to bandage a horse, to suture a horse, to lead a horse, to move a horse from pasture A to pasture B. It's just a simple headlamp. It's cheap. I carry one with me when I go traveling, just in case the electricity goes out in the hotels. Interruption of cash flow. If you have no electricity, guess what? The ATMs don't work. If you don't have cash and there's no power in a five-county area, you don't get cash out of a cash machine. You don't get gasoline out of the gasoline pump because those work off of electricity. Interruption of cash flow to businesses. How are you gonna pay people with paychecks? And if they've got a paycheck, if the banks don't have electricity, how are they gonna cash it? Loose livestock with no identification. A lot of brown horses, if you don't have them microchipped or you don't have them identified, it's very difficult to claim them. You need to think about that ahead of time. 
Dealing with casualties is heart-wrenching. Not only for the owners, but for the veterinarians and for the people who are coming across those animals, whether they're injured or they're deceased. Contaminated water, we already talked about what's in flood water. Physical stress and mental stress. Those of you here who have de dealt with um, catastrophic injuries on racehorses know what this is. If you've dealt with any of these natural disasters, you've encountered this in some way, shape, or form. Having plans in place already can make you so much further ahead of the curve in being able to recover your business, your home, your health after a disaster than if you have no plan at all. Have a personal plan, have a family plan. You have to keep yourself safe, you have to keep your family safe, your farm, or if you're in charge of a facility, have a facility plan. What would happen if the tornado sirens went off? Where would we go? Who's the incident commander who would tell us where to go? I already know where I'm gonna go. I'm going to the restroom. That's interior, that's away from, from windows. And we're in a fabulous facility that's got a lot of concrete and limestone around it. How do I start? This seems overwhelming to people of, she just gave me all of this homework, how am I ever gonna get this done? You don't have to have it done by tomorrow. But at some point you have to start. And you just take it off by little bits and pieces. The Extension Disaster Education Network is a group of people that have put a huge amount of resources on the internet that are free for everyone around the world to use. This is the land-grant university institution resources at work for you. It's not only for horses, but it's for all kinds of animals against all kinds of disasters, including how to talk to your children about, they've lived through a disaster, how do you talk to your children about a disaster? How do you remediate the mold that has started to grow in your barn by the time you actually get back to your farm? Huge amounts of resources on the Extension Disaster Education Network from our land-grant institutions. The American Association of Equine Practitioners has many resources online. Ready.gov has got a very simple template for a list of things that you can have for your personal and your family plan. Lots of resources there. If you're a facilities manager of a racetrack, a horse show venue, a business, work with your local emergency manager and your cooperative extension agent because they have a lot of resources and they are willing to help you to make a plan. If you have no clue of where to start for your facility, Every facility is going to have, is very unique. Every facility is going to have a different type of plan. One thing to always think about, what community mental health resources are available? Anybody who's lived through a disaster, everybody's got the adrenaline running, you're trying to help, you're helping to um, suture those lacerations to help those animals recover, to deal with the disaster, we're all human. We all need to help each other out. Here in Kentucky, we have the Kentucky Community Crisis Response Board. They're available 24-7, whether it's a school shooting, whether it's a hurricane, whether it's a plane that has gone down, whether it's a barn fire. That's a look, look at your local resources. Whatever community you're from, find out what your local mental health resources are because sooner or later, people need them. And that's our long-term recovery because people that are here that are listening to emergency management and response, it, it can take a toll on you. Just imagine horse after horse after horse with those skin injuries or burns or the multiple ty types of traumatic injuries that our surgeons deal with after high wind events tractor trailer events. It takes its toll. Reach out and ask for help. The best thing that you can do is to go up to someone and say, I need your help, and you would be amazed at what can come through the door to help you out. Many people don't know about the Disaster Distress Helpline, which is available 
in all 50 states and U.S. territories. It's 24-7, 365 days a year, whatever type of disaster it is. They have a line for the deaf and hard of hearing. They have it in Spanish and 30 different other languages. They have translators. People in Puerto Rico, all you have to do is text Ablanos to a, a specific line, and you can talk to a crisis counselor. That's how we recover from disasters. All you have to do is ask for some help. And if you, if you run into a door, you ask for help at the next door. If that door is closed, you keep asking for a door. This distri disaster distress helpline was probably overwhelmed after the multiple hurricanes that we had. That's why it's important to identify your local resources because people here, we're on the front lines. We are there to try to help our horses for veterinarians, we're there to help our clients' horses or other horses that are in distress, but we also have to take care of ourselves, both mentally and physically. And at the end of the day, go home and pet a horse, pet a puppy, cuddle your dog or cat. Um, that's my mental health relief, is to uh, go home and hug my dogs, hug, hug my husband. So I'd be willing to take any questions that come from the audience. So the question is, in a disaster, is it better to leave your horses in the stable or out of the stable? It depends. That's one of those questions that if you work with your county extension agent and your emergency manager or your fire chief, is it a if it's a flood and your barn is at the bottom of a hill, what do you think the answer is going to be? Let them out because they are going to drown. If your barn is at the top of a hill and you're in an area of high wind, tornadoes, what do you think the answer is going to be? Let them out. If you have a solid concrete barn facility and you have a tornado, I mean solid concrete, really well, good concrete, and you're in a tornado area and it's not on top of a hill and you've got a tornado coming, I would tend to leave my horses inside because you've got a lot of flying debris outside. It depends on the, your structure. It depends on the location of your structure and where it is in the to topography of your county. It's something to think about. And sometimes if you're out west in Montana and it's wildfires, you got to let them out and you got to let them loose to let them run for their lives. You're not going to let a bunch of horses loose, hopefully, in New York City because that's going to kill people. Human health and safety has got to come first. That's an excellent question. That's a question that always comes up, and my answer is always, it depends. Because you have to think about floodwaters, you have to think about high winds, and you have to think about the, the structures. I was on a webinar, and there was a tornado, set of tornadoes that went through North Carolina, and it was someone called in, and they said... Tornado sirens went off, we hit the basement, we came up, and we had a new barn that was on a slab. It was a brand new barn, not concrete. It was a, um, a metal building, but it was brand new. They came up, their house was gone, the barn was gone, the slab was there, the horses were gone, the fencing was gone. Tornadoes don't mess around. It could be a concrete building that could be gone. Mother Nature is an, is an awesome force to deal with. She gives us sunshine and rainbows. She also gives us some high winds and some challenges to work with. Can it take down a, a concrete structure? Absolutely. So that's a good question, something as part of your homework to go home and think about. Any other questions? I'm looking forward to our next panel discussion. Um, a personal plan, a family plan, a farm plan, a facilities plan. You can start it, you can do it. There's resources out there, and in the information is my contact um, information if you have questions afterwards. Thank you so much.